oil men are like cats. One never knows when listening to them whether they are fighting or making love. Kalust Gulbenkian could say whatever he liked about oil men because he had what they wanted, the key to Middle East oil. He claimed the rights to the oil prospects in Mesopotamia, now part of Iraq. A master of the Byzantine ways of the court of the Sultan, he insisted he had been granted a concession in 1914 by the Turkish Empire, which controlled the Middle East. If oil were ever found there, Gulbenkian would become fabulously wealthy. Mesopotamia and its potential oil became the prize sought by the British and the French as they fought the Turks in World War I. The Allies celebrated their victory in 1918. The Turkish Empire was one of the spoils of that victory. But when the British and the French came to claim their prize in Mesopotamia, they found one man standing in their way. Operating out of the Ritz Hotel in Paris, Kalust Gulbenkian lived by this maxim. Never give up an oil concession. When he thought he was uh, right, nothing would stop him to go up to the end, whatever were uh, his uh, adversaries in that situation, whether they were big oil companies or government and so on, he would stick to his position. I guess I have one hobby, and that is dogs. But that's a hobby. My real interest is in the oil business. And believe me, in these days of big business, no one can hope to succeed if he's not tied up heart and soul in what he is doing. Gulbenkian's greatest adversary, Walter Teagle, could often be found hunting on his Georgia plantation. He shot quail for sport. But his real quarry was the oil concession that Kalust Gulbenkian already claimed. Teagle headed the world's largest oil company, Standard Oil of New Jersey, and he was used to getting his own way. It's said that he took three months a year to hunt and fish, but that he never left oil behind. I think his main part was always to be with the oil world. It's a very closed corporation. They all know each other. They all hunt together, fish together, and try to outdo each other, I guess. That's the name of the game. The duel between Walter Teagle and Kalust Gulbenkian was to draw Western companies and governments into the Middle East with consequences for oil and the world that would extend to the present day. As a small boy, Kalust Gulbenkian would visit the bazaars of Constantinople, now Istanbul, imbibing the art of oriental negotiation. He would take his pocket money, and instead of buying candy, he would buy antique coins. A lifetime of deal-making had begun. The Gulbenkian family, Armenian by origin, had been traders for generations. Kalust's father had imported oil from Baku in the Russian Empire. For a time, he had even been the agent for the American company Standard Oil. Kalust went a step further to King's College, London, to study petroleum engineering. He was born just at a time, really, where oil was becoming uh, the industry of the future. So I think he took advantage of it. And uh, uh, the relation of the family with the Ottoman authorities enabled him, really, 
to get a position which normally is not uh, easy to obtain. When Gulbenkian returned to Turkey, the Ottoman authorities commissioned him to write a report about the oil prospects in the eastern province of Mesopotamia. Gulbenkian took his information for the report from travel books and German engineers. He himself never went there, but he became obsessed with the idea that this area would produce oil. For the next 15 years, he pursued other business interests in Constantinople. He ingratiated himself with the sultans and became their financial advisor. In 1912, with the sultan's support, he set up the Turkish Petroleum Company. By now, the great powers were showing interest in the oil potential of the Turkish Empire. The Germans were courting the Turks, and the British were becoming alarmed. Gulbenkian persuaded the Germans and the British to join together as partners in his company. In return, they would give him 5% of the potential oil wealth in Mesopotamia. Mr. Gulbenkian became Mr. 5%. The origin of his 5%, uh, the famous 5%, was that uh, uh, he obtained concessions uh, from uh, the Sultan of Turkey about, uh, I don't know, in the 1900s or so. And there were also various oil groups were fighting to get concessions. The Anglo-Persian problem, there was these BP now, the Shell, the Germans and this. And he saw, that was, I mean, with respect, I mean, his, his greatness, that if all these people competed against each other, no one get anywhere. And his idea was get them all together. And then at one moment, he had 40% of it. He let the other people in. It came down to 25%. And he uh, ended up with 5%. But his idea was always, it's much better to have a small slice of a big cake than a large slice of a small cake. When the war was over, the world was a different place. America had emerged as the new power. Walter Teagle recognized that it was oil that had helped win the war. War was essentially a petroleum war. Aside from the munitions, nothing was more important for the winning of the war than oil products. Oil drove our submarines, gasoline-driven trucks transported our supplies and our armies, and gasoline fed our airplanes. Peace now finds the gas engine supreme in industry. Transportation companies use it, farmers till their lands with it, and even the lumberman logs with it. witnessed the development of the automobile from a cumbersome, unreliable, costly machine to a beautiful, foolproof, comfortable conveyance selling at a fraction of its former price. Walter Teagle once delivered gasoline to Henry Ford. He predicted Ford's business would fail, but he was wrong. After the war, Ford's production soared to meet an ever-growing demand. Cars introduced new challenges to city life. And in Hollywood, silent comedy directors welcomed the car as one of their most valuable props.
Cars went everywhere. There just weren't enough roads to accommodate them. In July 1919, a caravan of army vehicles left Washington on a mission to demonstrate the need for highways. Volunteering for the assignment was the young captain, Dwight Eisenhower, who jumped at the chance to have an inexpensive holiday out west. The convoy was off to San Francisco. It took them three months to get there. The caravan was celebrated in all the towns and villages across what Ike later called Darkest America. But despite the acclaim, Ike best remembered the crossing for its difficulties. Roads varied from average to non-existent. Delays, sadly, were to be the order of the day. Some days when we had counted on 60 or 70 or 100 miles, we would do three or four. Drivers colored the air with expressions in starting and stopping that indicated a longer association with teams of horses than with internal combustion engines. More roads and more cars meant more demands on the country's fuel supply. Walter Teagle saw a crisis looming. It now has become a national question of no small importance to inquire just where the United States will get its future supply. It is imperative that government cooperate with industry in grasping the situation. The whole mood of the industry and of governments of both was that there was going to be an imminent shortage of, of oil. Uh, during the war, they had already put in a, a, what was called gasoline-less Sundays in the United States. People talked of the coming gasoline famine uh, that would come in the United States. And the experts said, we're going to run out of oil. One of the leading experts, in fact, said that the United States was going to run out of its known oil reserves in nine years and three months. The American Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, was alarmed. He called upon the nation's oilmen to look overseas for new sources of oil. Walter Teagle would lead the effort. Walter Teagle was a giant of a man. He was six foot three and almost 300 pounds in spells. He became a giant within the history of Standard Oil and indeed between, in the world oil industry. Uh, in many ways, he was the, the epitome of the organization man, the first 20th century oil man. He grew up with Standard Oil. He worked his way up from the bottom to the top, wide experience. He, understand, he understood how the parts of the company fit together. He was trained at Cornell University as a chemist, unlike many of the early oil men. He had a real good understanding of the technology of modern oil. Just before he graduated, he was offered a professorship as a chem you know, a chemistry department. And so he was terribly excited about that, thought it was wonderful, and he went home and he said to his father, um, Dad, I've decided to be a professor of chemistry at Cornell. And the father didn't say anything, nobody said anything. And he went upstairs and went to bed, and the next morning he came down and over his uh, chair was some overalls. And he said, what are these for? And the old man, his father said, those are for you to put on and ride on the back of a mule and sell oil. And that's how he started in the oil world, selling oil from the back of a mule. Oil was in Teagle's blood. He grew up on Cleveland's Euclid Avenue, John D. Rockefeller's old neighborhood. And like Gulbenkian, his family was in the oil business. Walter Teagle was born to oil. His grandfather and his maternal side had been John D. Rockefeller's original partner, and his father had been a pretty tough competitor of Standard Oil. Uh, finally, Standard Oil bought out uh, his father's company, and they got young Walter Teagle as part of the deal. Teagle's bosses groomed him to fill what were called John D.'s shoes. He rode with them in their private railway car as they inspected their oil fields and refineries. He learned how to play their high-stakes poker game. And then, when he was only 39, Teagle became president of Standard Oil of New Jersey, the new boss at 26 Broadway. He took charge right away. He moved in John D. Rockefeller's old roll-top desk into his office, and he began to assert his control over the company. And he dominated that company 
more than any man before or since, and indeed he dominated it more than John D. Rockefeller had dominated the old trust, and so there was very good reason that people referred to him simply as the boss. Boss Teagle was in charge of one of the world's largest enterprises. Jersey Standard had supplied a quarter of the Allies' oil in the recent war. In order to ship its product around the world, it maintained the largest merchant fleet under the American flag. But since the breakup of the old Standard Trust, the company had one grave weakness. Teagle inherited a company that was the largest oil refining company in the world, but it didn't have its own crude oil sources. And that meant that it was very vulnerable. In 1920, at the 50th anniversary celebration for Standard Oil, Teagle described the new company policy. Standard Oil is to be interested in every producing area, no matter in what country it is situated. Teagle's essential strategy was very simple. He wanted crude oil, and he would get it wherever he could get it. That meant looking at Texas, it meant Venezuela, it meant Russia, it meant the East Indies, and it also meant Iraq in the Middle East. And the man with the key to Iraq was, of course, Mr. 5%, Kalust Gulbenkian. Gulbenkian was now living in Paris and London. His lifestyle could not have been more different from Teagle's. Where Teagle was sociable, Gulbenkian was a recluse. One rare friend was Cesar Ritz founder of the famous hotels. Gulbenkian came to live as much in Ritz hotels as he did at home. While Teagle hunted, Gulbenkian collected art. His collection is now a museum in Lisbon. Throughout his life, he bought art to mark important stages in his oil dealings. He bought his first painting in 1907, the year he opened the Shell office in Constantinople, a Guardi. Then in 1910, he became a director of the Turkish National Bank and bought a Koro. In 1914, he closed the deal making him Mr. Five Percent and he bought Romney's Portrait of Miss Constable. Carlos Gulbenkian liked very much everything which was beautiful. The feminine beauty, the jewels which were accompanying the feminine beauty, uh, magnificent paintings, uh, any works of art which was beautiful was very, uh, he was very uh, impressed by all the beauty in nature too. Gobenkian's love of nature was like everything else about the man, idiosyncratic. He took daily walks in Hyde Park or the Bois de Boulogne in Paris. He would walk alone, followed by his chauffeur driving his Rolls Royce. The driver was instructed to sound his horn when he had walked exactly five kilometers. He would drink only a quarter of Bordeaux wine, not half or always a small bottle of Bordeaux wine. He would smoke two cigarettes per day. He had a cigarette box of two cigarettes, one for lunch, one for dinner, not three, not one, two. And almost always, he disciplined itself with uh, all these things. All the food was being weighted. He knew that he was eating 120 grams of meat, uh, 150 grams of fish. Everything was, and every day for the week, he was getting his menu. He knew what he would be eating. And I would be able even to tell you what he ate in 1921 on the 1st of May. This is his schedule for the year 1921. Rise at 7 a.m. Wash, shave, etc., 15 minutes. Swedish exercise, 15 minutes. Bath, in and out, 20 minutes. Rest in bed, friction, 20 minutes. Dress, red paper, 25 minutes. Quiet and well-masticated breakfast, 30 minutes. Walk toward office, 45 minutes. Taxi to office if necessary, 10 minutes. Work in office until about 6 o'clock latest, making seven hours work a day. Mm -hmm. 
Mencken had his own particular way of doing business. He would often take oil men on social excursions, delaying the dealings by a day or more. His object was to observe his opponent's every move. This helped him get the upper hand in the coming negotiations. People said that Gulbenkian was the most sus suspicious man they'd ever met. Uh, one simple example, he had determined that he wanted to live uh, longer than a, than a relative who would live to the age of 106. And to do that, he employed two sets of doctors so that one set could check up on the other. He didn't trust anybody. Walter Teagle sailed to Europe in the summer of 1922, thinking that he was going to pretty quickly put together a deal for the American companies to join the British and French companies in Iraq. He was wrong. He hadn't counted on Kalus Gulbenkian. I'm not any oil czar of the world, but there is one, and you've never heard of him. His name is Gulbenkian. He won't let me in to see him. Just won't bother with me. All the corporate power vested in Walter Teagle was no match for the willpower of Kalus Gulbenkian. One of the great confrontations of this period of history was that between Teagle representing the 20th century firm of Standard Oil and Gulbenkian, who in many ways embodied the 19th century virtues of entrepreneurship, the sharp trader, uh, the man on the fringe trying to, to set up deals between uh, various groups of people. Uh, Teagle and Gulbenkian uh, immediately understood that they had different interests and, and, and the debate over Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian or Iraqi oil uh, quickly became in part a debate between these two men. The oil groups headed by the Americans had only one aim, to wipe out the rights of the minority by hook or by crook. That is, my 5% participation. The issues between them can really be summarized in, two, in two, two matters. Number one, Gulbenkian wanted to be paid his 5% royalty in cash or gold shillings, and so Mr. 5% also became known as the gold shilling gentleman. The second thing was that Gulbenkian wanted to hold on to the right that he had negotiated into the original Turkish Petroleum Company contract, and that was that all of the participants agreed that if any one of them went into any deals anywhere in the Middle East within the territory that had been the old Ottoman Empire, they would all go together. So what Gulbenkian was fighting for was not only his 5% for Iraqi oil, but the right to 5% of the oil found anywhere in the Middle East. The negotiations were to drag on for six years. At one point, Teagle met Gulbenkian at the Carlton Hotel in London. Surely, Mr. Gulbenkian, you are too good an oil merchant not to know that the property won't stand any such rate as that. Young man, young man, don't you ever call me an oil merchant. I am not an oil merchant, and I'll have you distinctly understand that. I apologize if I have offended you. I do not know what to call you or how to classify you if you aren't an oil merchant. I classify myself as a business architect. I designed this company and that company. I designed this Turkish petroleum company, and I made a room for debt earning, and I made a room for the French, and I made a room for you. Now the three of you are trying to throw me out on my ass. Gulbenkian knew the time was on his side that as they got closer and closer to exploring and discovering for oil, that things would have to start to go in his way. And exploration began in 1925, 26. At that point, the urgency on the part of Teagle and the others to make a deal started to become stronger and stronger. In 1927, in April, they began drilling for oil in Iraq. A few months later, in October, Oil was struck at a place near Kirkuk that was an astonishing gusher, 90,000 barrels a day. The American consul reported. With a great roar, oil burst from the drill hole and rose in the air to a height of 50 feet above the derrick. The surrounding countryside was drenched with oil. It was the first oil discovery in the Arab Middle East. In these makeshift refineries, the Iraqi oil industry began. In July 1928, after six years of negotiations, an agreement was reached on Gulbenkian's terms. 
Then he drew a line around the boundaries of what had been the Ottoman Empire with a thick red pencil, except for Persia, now Iran, and Kuwait. All the major Middle East oil fields were inside that red line. Any oil discovered by any of the companies would be shared, and Gulbenkian would take his 5%. Mr. Five Percent himself refused to attend the signing of the so-called Red Line Agreement. His son Nubar chartered an airplane, took his retinue of lawyers and secretaries, and set off to Belgium to finalize the deal. His father bought a painting. Destined to become the world's richest man, he took a Mediterranean cruise. One day, Gulbenkian spotted a curiously shaped ship. He asked what it was, despite decades spent negotiating and fighting over oil. Gulbenkian had never seen an oil tanker. Boss Teagle also got what he wanted: access to Middle East oil. But by then. The whole game had changed. The basic thrust for the Red Line Agreement was the notion that there was going to be a shortage of oil in the United States and in the world. Thus, you had to get into these new territories. But in the middle of that arduous negotiation, by about 1925-26, the whole circumstances started to change, and one after another, major oil fields were discovered in the United States, and what had looked to be a shortage. Turned out to be an ever-growing surplus. For the people of Texas and Oklahoma, oil boom towns became a way of life. Towns like Borger became little cities overnight. Fields with names like Boleg. Seminole, Big Lake, and Wink brought people from across the country. Those who followed from one boom town to the next were called boomers. Oil is like any other kind of work. You think when you get into it, you'll only stay there long enough to make yourself a pile and then get out. But it don't work out that way. Many of the oil jobs were dangerous, like handling nitroglycerin. You don't make but one mistake handling this stuff, though. One mistake, and then if they ever find an arm or a toe, they put it in a box and bury it for you. Some towns were company camps, little cities where the housing reflected the pecking order. Class distinction in that camp? I don't know. It was there. You felt it. You knew it was there as children. Instead of mixing, there was this definite break according to your station in the company. You knew that Mr. So and So was the superintendent, and his daughter got so you know she wouldn't speak to you. The men on top came from everywhere. The major companies were there, but there were plenty of independents too. Traditionally, independents find oil, and then majors develop the fields. And that's the way I think most of the industry has developed. But in, in, when you look in the context of the 20s, you did not have a mature American oil industry. There were major companies that were just fledglings then. But the money came in from the East, and they were able to become uh, large companies. But the independent role is still there. Uh, we have the guys that go out and risk all one day you can be rich, the other day you can be poor. But that's the nature of the business. In the age of the flapper, automania became a national passion. Cars were plentiful and cheap gas made it all possible. Henry Ford's 10 millionth car was produced in 1924. By 1929, three quarters of the world's cars were in the United States. America was undoubtedly the leading land of gasoline. The most famous advertising executive of his day was Bruce Barton. Barton exhorted a convention of oil men to reflect upon what he called the magic of gasoline. 
Stand for an hour beside one of your filling stations. Talk to the people who come up to buy gas. Discover for yourself what magic a dollar's worth of gasoline a week has worked in their lives. My friends, it is the juice of the fountain of eternal youth that you're selling. It is health, it is comfort, it is success. You must put yourself in the place of the man or the woman in whose lives your gasoline has worked its miracles. Fill up with Phillips and be on your way. Fill up with Phillips. Gas used to be sold without a brand name. Now new signs and symbols were plastered across the American landscape. of gasoline was the miracle of mobility. Service stations became the new secular temples for a society that had taken to the road. More cars meant a massive boost in gasoline sales. New oil wells kept on coming in. More people were producing more oil than ever before. The ultimate outcome of this uh, despite the frenzy, or in fact because of the frenzy, was too much oil. Uh, too much oil which threatened price stability, which threatened the economic health of all the companies and indeed of the whole industry. Overproduction occurred this year in a form so malignant as to seem to be without precedent. Wildcatters continued to find more oil, bringing it upon the market regardless of the real need for oil. In 1928, Boss Peagle journeyed to the Scottish Highlands. The glutton oil was now worldwide. It was this, and the shooting, that brought Peagle here. He was to join other industry leaders in secret at a castle called Aknakari. In 1928, we let the house, as was our custom, for the season. It includes August and September. I remember my father telling me that it had been sublet to Sir Henry Detherding. And I think at first he probably thought that he was up here for the sporting with his friends. We then learnt later, partly through newspaper reports and so on, that he had with him Mr. Clark Teagle and Sir John Cadman and others. And we obviously suspected from that that there was more to it than uh, just shooting. Sir Henry Detterding was boss of Royal Dutch Shell. Sir John Cadman headed Anglo-Persian, or British Petroleum. With them was Walter Teagle, who would bask in his favorite milieu, hunting and oil. Oversupply, especially from the Soviet Union, had caused a bitter price war. But at Aknakari, cooperation, not competition, was to be the order of the day. Here, the world's oil moguls hammered out a plan to divide up markets and share facilities, thereby eliminating competition and promoting efficiency. It's an extraordinary irony when you look back to see that the Red Line Agreement was signed just a few weeks before the Aknakari meeting, because the whole thrust of the Red Line Agreement, the, the drive to get into uh, Iraq, to open the door, was based on the premise the world was going to run out of oil, and you needed to desperately fight for new sources. The meeting at Aknakari was to respond to the immediate problem that, in fact, there was not a shortage of oil, but the number one issue facing the oil industry was that there was a huge surplus that was just getting bigger. Aknakari gave birth to the as-is agreement. The agreement, of course, could not apply to the United States because of the American antitrust laws but the cartel could operate everywhere else. Together, the companies froze market shares and set prices. Agna Carey is a pipe dream. It's the idea that, that the major companies with access to the major sources of oil can somehow control, can make a cartel that will control the, the quantity and the price of oil. In the, in the realities of the late 20s and early 30s, it simply can't be done. There's too many other competitors, there's too much oil, the competitive pressures can't be dampened, they are far too great, 
They overwhelm any cooperative effort to stabilize the market for oil. Nothing but nothing could stop America's wildcatters who continued to hunt for oil across the Southwest. Many of them were running two-bed operations, scrounging for money to drill up their dreams. One of them was Columbus Joyner. People called him Dad. He was a good promoter. He knew where money could be found. He'd read the obituaries in the paper, and then he'd write florid letters to the wealthy widows of the recently departed. Every woman has a sudden place on her neck. And when I touch it, they automatically start writing me a check. Of course, the checks are not always good. One day, he wrote to the widow who owned Millwood Farm. Miss Daisy M. Bradford, Henderson, Texas. Dear friend, do you believe that there is hidden in the bowels of the earth untold millions of oil, gas, and other minerals? One good oil well will be worth more to the citizens of your community than has all the cotton that has been raised in that community since the Civil War. My friend, now is the time to have a vision of the great possibilities that lie before you and enter wholeheartedly into the work of opening up the mineral resources of your community. Your friend, C.M. Joyner. Dad Joyner had a partner, Doc Lloyd. Lloyd said he was a geologist, but his background always remained mysterious. Some said Doc Lloyd was a patent medicine salesman. Some said he was a veterinarian. Anyway, Lloyd drew a map of Daisy Bradford's farm and persuaded her to let them begin drilling. The first two wells Lloyd and Joyner drilled were dry holes. Joyner was so broke he often couldn't pay his men. He issued so many IOUs that they became a local currency. Well, he was tenacious as a bulldog, of course, or he couldn't have drilled this third well. But Mr. Joyner had a way of a persuasion, I'll say. And a lot of people believed in the man. And he knew that there was oil. He just knew it. A tent city called Joynerville grew up near his third well. The road was packed with Model T's and Model A's as the curious gathered to watch and wait. A month later, the well proved to be a gusher. Dad Joyner turned out to be, after all, a true prophet. The boom that followed dwarfed all before it. The Great Depression was on and jobs were scarce everywhere, except in East Texas. People came in by the thousands, and they were all hungry. The story was told that if you threw a ham sandwich up in the air in the lobby of the Gregg Hotel, that 40 legs would be broken and scrambled to get to the, to the get catch the sandwich. J.Y. McKinnon came to East Texas three months after he'd heard about Dad Joyner's gusher. Some of these wells we drilled, they called it bottom hole pay. And you'd have to drill a well and complete it and bring it in, and then you'd get your money. Within eight months, production was at half a million barrels a day. The field proved huge, 45 miles long by up to 10 miles wide. I would go and come with those men, and a lot of times it'd be out in the field. I have put my typewriter on the hood of a car many times and typed a lease. There were many wells drilled after the first one came in. Oh, Kilgore was the richest acre on earth. It was just as close as you could get those derricks. Beautiful, because it meant money. Everywhere people looked, and some places they didn't, they found oil. 
They put Derrick through the marble floor of a bank, and when oil was struck under a black church, the parish closed its membership and divided up the proceeds. The stories of large oil are like the stories of gold being found. Everyone sooner or later finds out about it. And my father was in the position that, always wanting to be in the oil business, he felt that this was a place he could make a fortune. Jake Simmons Jr. would become a millionaire, but Dad Joyner found himself in legal trouble, having sold the same leases over and over again. He was forced to sell his rights for $1.3 million to a man he called Boy, H.L. Hunt. Dad Joyner's leases were to be the beginning of Hunt's legendary fortune. Joyner wildcatted until his death at 87, but he never struck it rich again. Big oil fields had been discovered before in America. Big oil booms had taken place before, but there was nothing to compare with East Texas. It was like a, a Saudi Arabia. The scale was huge. Uh, at one point, East Texas could have supplied half of the total oil consumption in the United States. It was so big, so unusual, it became known as the Black Giant. What was so striking about it is that it had not been discovered by a major company, it had not been discovered by a geologist, but it had been discovered by these characters, Dad Joyner and Doc Lloyd. Now, the major big oil tycoons would have never paid any attention to a, a, a Dad Joyner. They would have never thought about it. They would have never seen him. And yet, uh, what uh, Dad Joyner did uh, had a profound impact on the entire oil business. The flood of the East Texas oil field soon became unmanageable. The chaos was enormous. People were almost drilling wells on top of each other. Um, they worked night and day. It was um, uh, absolutely unregulated. Oil was so plentiful, and there was so much of it, that it got to 10 cents a barrel. Can you imagine selling a barrel of oil uh, at 10 cents a barrel? But that's what it was. Oil prices fell still lower to 6 cents, even 2 cents a barrel. Panic engulfed the oil-producing states. The independents were on the road to ruin. They were selling oil for much less than it cost them to produce it. The majors were also threatened. You have to remember also at this time that the Great Depression has, has occurred. Uh, in the 20s, there was a growing demand for oil, but in the 30s, there's a stagnant demand. So you have the worst of all situations for the major companies, at least, the supply of oil going up and up, the demand coming down, and these major companies in particular are sitting with hundreds of millions of dollars invested on the basis of a certain price of oil, a certain stability, and both the price and the stability are shattered by East Texas. To stop the anarchy, the governors of the major oil-producing states, Texas and Oklahoma, moved to halt production with armed force. I walked in the bank one day, and there were just soldiers all over the place. I wondered, what in the world? I walked, <laughs> walked on the outside and looked up and down the street, soldiers everywhere. Well, I knew that they had declared martial law. Several thousand National Guardsmen and mounted rangers descended on the East Texas and Oklahoma oil fields. But martial law was only a temporary solution. No policing was possible in a field where there were so many people working so many rigs and, and so much oil coming out of the ground being carted away. There was oil literally spilled on the earth and in some places the earth was black. In Texas, a state agency called the Railroad Commission attempted a more long-term solution. It established a system of production quotas called pro-rationing. For a short time, the market stabilized, but then prices collapsed again. The local citizens panicked. They appealed to the new president. Franklin D. Roosevelt, president, Washington, D.C. The oil industry has completely collapsed. Stop. 
This great oil field totters over the abyss of ruin because of the outrageous actions of overproducers. Stop. Our properties are being drained, and we landowners are powerless to stop this damage to ourselves and to the state of Texas. Stop. In Washington, President Roosevelt recognized what he called the wretched conditions in the oil business. He made his Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes, oil administrator, and told him to solve the crisis. Harold Ickes was a self-styled curmudgeon. He was difficult, he was suspicious, he had his own wiretapping um, instruments within his own investigative service within the Interior Department that made sure that people were loyal to him. There's a story that he uh, got annoyed with people coming in to work a little late. So he directed the police of the Interior Department to lock the doors of the Interior Building uh, at exactly 9 o'clock. And then he waited for 10 minutes and opened the doors and took names himself, personally, of everybody who came in the door after 9. Uh, suffice it to say, they started coming in on time. Ickes plain disliked big businessmen. He called them barbarians in dress suits but he saw oil as a vital national resource. We have passed from the Stone Age to bronze to iron to the Industrial Age and now to an age of oil. Without oil, American civilization as we know it could not exist. In East Texas, Ickes investigators found that pro-rationing quotas were hated. Many people thought that the law was not valid, that they owned the lease, they owned the oil, they could be, produce as much of it as they liked. And they started running oil in excess of the amount allowed by the law. That was known as hot oil. The oil was put into barrels, covered by weeds, stored during the day and then at night transported across state boundaries. There was always graft and money uh, handed over be from one person to another to get that oil out of state and to get it into production. It was very lucrative uh, for the people who were running it. Today, Walter C. Teagle, president of the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey, came to see me by appointment. His company is the largest producing company in the oil field. His proposal is that the government make an oil reserve out of the East Texas oil field. He said this is the way and the only way to control the production of hot oil. It seemed rather a startling proposition to come from the president of the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey. Boss Teagle had, once again, discovered the limits of corporate power. This time it wasn't Kalust Gulbenkian, but the black giant itself that threatened to overwhelm Standard Oil and all the other producers. To put the industry back on course, the federal and state governments worked out a system of quotas and regulations. Thirty years later, the founders of OPEC would look to that system as their model. But in the short term, a new law that curbed the flow of bootleg oil was to restore order in the oil field. The days of hot oil are over. The law shall be supreme. In some ways, East Texas can be seen as the last hurrah for the old-fashioned independence. It's the last time that unregulated production is allowed in a major field in the United States. It's the last time that uh, oil is produced in a frenzy uh, in which whoever has the rights to the oil underneath the surface is allowed to pump it out as fast as they would like. The great irony for the oil industry was that the key issue facing uh, it had turned around 180 degrees. The 1920s had begun with the specter of shortage and that had shaped the strategies of companies and the strategies of governments. By the late 1920s and the middle of the 1930s, the problem was surplus, too much oil, and that became the central concern, the central obsession, both of uh, oil companies and of national governments when they focused on oil. Oil had touched the lives of all Americans, no matter how poor. The 
the victims of the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, now traveled by automobile. The words of oil administrator Harold Ickes echo across the drought-stricken American landscape. We have passed from the Stone Age to bronze to iron to the Industrial Age and now to an age of oil. Without oil, American civilization as we know it could not exist. Next, on the prize, war and oil. Poland, 1939, Blitzkrieg. Hitler's dream of world conquest was fast becoming reality. 1941, Pearl Harbor. Japan scores a deadly bullseye. But behind the tanks and kamikaze strikes lies the untold story of the Axis defeat, oil. Based on the Pulitzer Prize-winning book by Daniel Yergin, The Prize.